Good evening, everyone. My name is David Van Zandt, and I'm the president here at the New School. This is a, a really proud uh, moment for the New School to be able to, to host this very important event uh, here. I first want to extend a personal welcome uh, from the New School to Governor Jerry Brown, Governor of California, uh, and also to Dr. Wan. And also Dr. Juan Close, the Executive Director of UN Habitat. <laughs> Dr. Close will be delivering a special statement um, from UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I'd also like to welcome each of the mayors uh, and city officials from all over the world that are joining us today. And I want to congratulate everyone who's involved with this uh, on this very much historic signing of the under two uh, MOU, as well as your support for the UN's new uh, sustainable development goals. At the New School, we have many world leaders um, come to our campus and speak and meet our students and faculty, but I think never before have we collected um, or we've hosted a, collect, a collective of urban leaders committed to such a critical common cause. It really is inspiring. And I think it's especially fitting uh, uh, at the New School, where we're engaged with our pressing issues of the time, our students who come from many of the countries that our mayors represent tonight, come to the New School to learn collaborative, uh, collaboratively how to create change, how to design solutions to very difficult problems, and how to harness their own creativity, uh, creativity and knowledge and values to improve the world's cities. SDG number 11, I think, resonates especially strongly here at the New School. It is the commitment, and I quote, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So I congratulate and commend the organizations uh, who have worked together to create this momentous event. The Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the Campaign for Urban uh, SDGs, the Global Task Force uh, of Local and Regional Governments, and finally, my colleagues here at the New School. In particular, Professor Shagun Morota. He has worked tirelessly uh, to ensure that the New School has been engaged and visible in these important conversations and advancements, and I thank him very much. <laughs> now it's my great honor to turn over the podium uh, to Aro Marevi, who is our, our moderator. Um, Aro is the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, but probably more importantly in 2006, he was a fellow here at the New School's India-China Institute. So, Era, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you back. So please come on up to the stage. Oh. It's a pleasure to be back here at the New School, but I think more important than us, this is a historic occasion for many of us in this room. Uh, we started this journey about two years ago, uptown in the Low Library, where a whole range of us launched the campaign for the Urban SDG. Today, on the eve of the 70th session of the United Nations, we are on the threshold of achieving an urban sustainable development goal, goal 11, as the President just laid out just now. But more than that, as far as this partnership has built over the last two years, all the major urban groups have come together to deal not only with what Goal 11 deals with, but with a whole range of other goals. Because the mayors in this room have shown us and have led us over the last many years to, to show that if we need to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, it's not only questions of resilience and transportation and sustainability that are integrated into Goal 11, but at least 11 other goals, dealing with water, dealing with education, dealing with health, dealing with energy, dealing with the end of poverty. So this is not only a gathering around goal 11, it is also 11 plus 11 more. And the most important thing that we've learned, and our mayors here have led the way across the world in this, 
is this is an opportunity for a new set of partnerships. Partnerships in the cities, which have happened for many years, from Rio onwards, Agenda 21, and a whole range of other processes led by our partners here, UCLG, ICLE, C40, and a whole range of other institutions. But also a partnership between cities and regional governments. And we heard, and we will hear Governor Brown. And finally, and this I think is the beginning of this historic opportunity, a dialogue of partnership between the 200 odd members of the United Nations, the member states, and local and regional governments. This in a sense is our opportunity and our call to members of the United Nations to establish a partnership of 200 countries odd and at least 2,000 cities because it is that partnership of 200 plus 2,000 at least, if not more, that will enable us to actually implement these goals over the next 15 years. This process started maybe 40 years ago uh, with Habitat One, the creation of UNCHS, now UN Habitat. So I'm going to request uh, the executive director uh, of, of UN Habitat uh, to come up and uh, read an address from the uh, Secretary General. Uh, Dr. John Kloss is not only the, the director of, of UN Habitat, but also the former mayor of Barcelona, and hence he understands the challenges that we're dealing with here remarkably well. Thank you very much. Well, it's my honor to deliver in a minute the, the, the words of the Secretary General. But let me first uh, thank all of you for the efforts that you have been doing during these two years in uh, um, lobbying in the most uh, nice uh, sense in order to uh, reach this uh, sustainable development goal, goal uh, number 11. I think that uh, is important because, uh, as you know, mm, a lot of urbanization is going to happen in the developing world. And uh, I am living, in fact, there now in Nairobi. And when I talk with the leaders of the developing world, they have some difficulties on understanding the relationship of uh, urbanization uh, with uh, prosperity, with wealth, with development. Uh, they, are, they are more overwhelmed by the ailments of urbanization, uh, problems, uh, congestion, lack of uh, uh, water and sanitation, uh, lack of uh, housing, slums, etc. And uh, such a pressing demand uh, in terms of improving the conditions of city, uh, of the city in general, um, Defuminates the fact that urbanization is a tool for development. It's an accelerator of development. And those countries do need development. And they do need acceleration of development. And, and uh, for them to promote uh, urbanization, good urbanization, productive urbanization, sometimes is difficult to understand because whenever they are uh, confronted with urbanization, they mainly face problems, difficulties, challenges, political, but also uh, technical, economic, uh, financial, etc. And we need to change this mentality because uh, if we don't make clear uh, in, in, in the forthcoming years that urbanization for developing countries is a tool for development, not just an accumulation of problems, the governments, they are not placing enough attention to how to design the cities in such a manner they, that they deliver the expected outcomes in terms of development. They are more worried about just coping with the problems than on addressing the real uh, conditions which makes a city productive, which makes a city more able to generate jobs, which makes a city more able to deliver wealth. And I think that this is uh, a crucial. In fact, it's a change of paradigm in urbanization in the de developing world, where, by the way, m more of the 3.5 billion people that they are going to urbanize in the next uh, 30, 40 years 
are living today. We now have a urban population of 3.5 billion, and we are going to reach 7 billion of urban dwellers in 40 years' time. And 90% more, 95% of this growth is going to happen in developing countries. And is there where are the basic uh, uh, needs of finding out the tools uh, that make a city uh, deliver the positive outcomes of urbanization, not just the negative. And I am very pleased, and I thank the chairman of the university that we are here in an in a academic uh, 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 house, uh, forum, uh, and uh, I think that uh, academia uh, needs to provide us a lot of uh, support also in, in analyzing what it, that makes a city uh, um, productive. We already know what makes a city a disaster. But it's not as clear as it looks uh, to find out what it makes a city productive and functional. And this is, the, I think, that the big question. The change of mind that we need to, to find out uh, in our approach to, to urbanization. Fortunately enough, we have reached the goal uh, of sustainable development. For the first time in, in the United Nations, the urban, sorry, the development policy has an urban goal. Well, that's fantastic. It's the proof that there's a new understanding that urbanization brings development. But now the next question is how? Which kind of urbanization brings development? Because not every urbanization brings development. What are the conditions that makes urbanization deliver wealth? And this is the question that I think that uh, uh, needs to be answered uh, for the sake of these 3.5 billion people that are going to be urbanized in the next 30 or 40 years uh, they, they deserve. And uh, I sincerely, uh, as I said, thank you for your immense uh, effort in, in uh, helping to clarify the ideas and put clearly urbanization as a um, tool, as an accelerator of development. Thank you very much. I am going now to read the, the message of the Secretary General. He says, tomorrow world leaders will adapt the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Adopt, sorry, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. An inspiring framework aimed at ending poverty and building lives in peace and dignity for all in a healthy planet. The role of urbanization in supporting sustainable development is increasingly important. Cities are at the heart of many global challenges and opportunities. I commend your efforts in having promoted Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is dedicated to making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, safe resilient, and uh, sustainable. Sustainable Development Goal 11 calls for an urban transformation which requires political will and the capacity to uh, coordinate many actors and stakeholders. If cities join forces with governments, the private sector, civil society, and urban planners, they co can become the hubs for climate action and sustainable development solutions. Mayors will play a critical role. They can use their local regulatory and fiscal powers to catalyze action. Most importantly, they can give voice to their citizens and advocate for well-planned cities that serve as engines of prosperity, innovation, and inclusiveness. I welcome the commitments that you are about to make. I look forward to your contributions in implementing Sustainable Development 11 
And as we move towards the crucial climate change conference in Paris in December, and the Habitat 3 conference in Quito 2016, uh, let us also remember that one of the defining features of the new agenda is that the goals are integrated and holistic, and that your efforts are meant to have an impact across the entire spectrum of the agenda. That is how we will leave none behind. Thank you, you, uh, for your engagement and support. Please accept my best wishes for a successful event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kloss, for your remarks and the message from the Secretary General. I am going to now invite uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, one of the leading world economists who worked in this area, but also very, very important, continuity with the past, the creation of the MDGs, and he is the special advisor to the Secretary General for the MDGs and the future. Uh, the SDGs, in some senses, have been critically determined by his role in helping frame that. So the director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you very much, Aro. What a wonderful occasion. I just do want to correct one thing you said. You talked about the 200-odd uh, 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 countries of the UN, and I wanted to say they're not all odd. Uh, a few of them are. Ours is odd. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, 193 member states will be joining together tomorrow to uh, do what Pope Francis called on the Congress to do today uh, when he said uh, that we must redirect our steps. We need a new direction because the current direction, while it is achieving one thing, and that is a lot of generation of wealth, which it is achieving, it is not achieving two other things that are crucial, and that is social inclusion and environmental sustainability. And the beauty of the agenda that is being adopted tomorrow, and remarkably adopted with a full unanimity worldwide, is that it calls on us to achieve three things together, economic well-being, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. It's what Pope Francis uh, has called integral human development. It's an integrated vision. And I mention Pope Francis not only because uh, I think we're all in Pope mania right now, at least I am, uh, with the Pope Francis arriving in New York and uh, with the excitement of his telling the world leaders tomorrow morning that this is fundamentally a moral challenge. We're also here because the partnership that is being supported was actually launched in the Vatican uh, on July 21 and 22. Uh, and uh, in Pope Francis's uh, 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 presence uh, and in the home of uh, this gentleman, uh, Bishop uh, Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo is our dear, dear friend who is the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Science, Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. And in the great marriage of reason and faith of uh, the church, uh, Bishop Marcello is uh, bringing the reason of uh, world science uh, to, to bear. And we saw the incredible fruits of that in Laudato Si, the wonderful encyclical. So on July 21, 22, mayors from around the world, many of them here, gathered at the Vatican. Uh, Pope Francis spoke to the assembly about the urgency of climate change, about the profound injustices of human trafficking and the other crimes of social exclusion that are being addressed in the Millennium Development Goals and called on the uh, leaders uh, of cities and uh, 
uh, and uh, states and provinces uh, with Governor Jerry Brown uh, present and helping to lead that meeting, uh, that all of uh, you take on this challenge. As Aro uh, and as uh, Jean Close have uh, emphasized, and as Secretary General uh, Ban Ki moon uh, just said in the statement, taking on SDG 11, which was the campaign uh, that uh, many of you led to have an urban sustainable development goal, is not about one goal. It's about the place of cities in all of the goals. So you're taking on the challenge of sustainable development. That means you're taking on the integral vision of development, of economic, social, and environmental challenges. This is, in my opinion, uh, the most important thing we can do now. We celebrate today. We will be in joy tomorrow. Uh, we will marvel at uh, the world coming together on this agenda tomorrow evening. Uh, and then uh, Sunday morning, <laughs> the work starts, uh, or Saturday morning, I should say, the work starts after we agree. We have 15 years to achieve very ambitious goals, but they're ambitious in part because they have to be. We've lost time. We've waited a long time. Our backs are to the wall, or if you want another better metaphor, we're at the edge of the cliff on climate change. Uh, and so we're going to have to act quickly. I want to say to Governor Jerry Brown, who's been a leader in this effort for decades, and to uh, Mayor de Blasio, my mayor, uh, who is leading very, very strongly and vigorously, and to the mayors here who are assembled because you're committed to this, thank you for your leadership. We depend on it. We support you in every way we can. The UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network that I'm honored to direct on behalf of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon stands ready and eager to work with all of you on all of the technical solutions with your universities, with your think tanks, to help solve very complex systems challenges that we're all going to face in the coming years but it's your heart and your vision and your leadership that we count on. Thank you very much. So this is an evening of celebration of mayors and regional governors. I'm going to invite a few of us. We have about 40 plus mayors here from across the world and regional governors. I'm going to invite a few up. Uh, to join us just now so that we're able to hear from them in terms of the commitment and the way forward. Um, so first, uh, Governor Brown uh, from California, uh, Mayor Parks from Johannesburg. If you can join me on stage, then we'll take that from here. <laughs> Mayor Lacenda from Bella Horizonte. Uh, Mayor Angela Bra Bur Burke from Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, Mayor Cabell from Copenhagen. Mayor Jamal from Bandache in Indonesia. Uh, Mitran Nandru, Mayor of New Orleans. And Khalifa Sal, the Mayor of Dakar. <laughs> While our mayors are coming up on stage, I should also celebrate this partnership, at least over the last few years, that have brought together all the major urban groups in the world. They've been absolutely central to bring this together. UN Habitat, UCLG, ICLE, C40, WIGO, Cities Alliance, uh, and SDI. It is this partnership and the ongoing relationship that we built with members uh, of, of, of the United Nations that enabled us to bring us here. So I'm going to um, invite uh, mayors to speak um, from the floor or from the dais as it, as it may be. Uh, first, Governor Brown. Thank you. Um, very important set of commitments we're making tonight. Uh, California has uh, made its commitment, will continue increasingly over the next several years. Uh, the big fact that we can all uh, reflect on is that three billion of the poorest people in this world are generating only 5% of the greenhouse gases. And yet it's the poorest people on the planet uh, and in uh, wherever, who are going to suffer the most. And it's that, uh, that disjunction between the generators 
of suffering and the bearers of suffering that uh, we have to uh, deal with and confront. Uh, the problems uh, of climate change and the problems of social inclusion and sustainability, uh, these are rather abstract goals when um, compared with the political day-to-day -day, uh, issues that uh, people talk about, whether mayors or governors or presidents or senators, there's plenty to talk about. And if you look at the presidential debates, you realize that most of it is not worth listening to. I'll say that again. Most of it is not worth listening to. Uh, uh, important, I don't say that they're, all the points are, are insignificant. They're not. But this big uh, issue in front of us is of a world that's so unequal, that's so unsustainable, and is so full of, of power, but contradictions. And that really is something we, we can't take our eyes off. The doomsday clock, which is a measurement of the threats to humanity of weapons of mass destruction, has now been moved to three minutes to doomsday, three minutes to midnight, for two, two factors. One, of course, the nuclear uh, weapons that are all over the world, at least in the nuclear powers, and being built up uh, as we speak. So that's one thing. But then they've added to the doomsday clock the measurement of climate change. And climate change is a longer-term threat, very clear, very devastating, very certain, but not quite arrived. Arrived a little bit, fires are burning in California, but nowhere near the comprehensive total impact that will be felt all over the world. So that's one thing. The nuclear bombs, you never know. They can get an accident tonight, can, tomorrow, the year after. As Robert McNamara said, how have we made it? Not by deterrence, but by luck, pure luck. So that's a serious thing. We're not talking about that one. I can't do much about that. But when it comes to sustainability and uh, environmental uh, protection, social inclusion, and creating a prosperity that, uh, that can be spread, mayors can do something about that, governors, uh, academics, and all the people that are in this room. So uh, tonight we celebrate this 11th goal, uh, a goal that uh, is reflected in many of the things that we're doing in California. So uh, today we also signed the Memorandum of Understanding that now covers uh, 28 different jurisdictions. And that's a real step forward. We're going to get more. Uh, the Paris uh, Conference of the Conference of the Parties is really awakening uh, the entire world. And with Pope Francis talking to the Congress today and uh, with all the other uh, movements around the world with China uh, expressing really deep and serious commitment to dealing with climate change and many other countries as well. But all that kind of high-level stuff it needs a certain push uh, from the periphery, from the bottom. And the grassroots has to uh, ignite the spirit of change, spirit of sustainability, and the spirit of inclusion. We're a long way from that. In fact, when I read these uh, goals, uh, it, 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 it's daunting. That's all I can say, because I've been around politics for a long time. And just to do any of this uh, takes heroic efforts. The world uh, is organized in a certain way. It has a powerful market system that is totally dependent on fossil fuel. To now decarbonize, to make more equal and more uh, uh, abundant and inclusionary kind of uh, economic and political process. This is not for the faint of heart. It takes great faith, uh, great will, great commitment. And tonight, uh, we take a step. It's only a step. And the path forward, if we're going to make it, and there is a question of whether we're going to make it or not, uh, will depend on many, many uh, events and commitments such as we're seeing here tonight. So I don't uh, in any way uh, want to speak glibly. Uh, we're up against 
an existential threat that is very real. And it's a more real probably the younger you are, because it may take a while. I don't know how long, five years, 10 years, 25 years, but we have to make a turn or we're gonna have cataclysmic consequences in ways we can barely imagine. And it is very difficult to imagine evil. It's very difficult to imagine uh, the catastrophic consequences that the power of mankind now possesses. But if we can summon that imagination, then we can mobilize the will and the political action starting right at the city level and moving upward to the national and international level. That is the significance of what we do tonight, to mobilize against the near inevitable, but certainly we can prevent it with this kind of effort and imagination. Uh, but I don't want anyone to feel too comfortable tonight because there's no basis for comfort. There's real threat out there, and there's real blindness, and there's real complacency. And it's only going to be if enough people, including my friend standing up in the back, can generate the political will, can we really make the turn. And it's a turn to decarbonize our modern economy and do it in a way, well, just to do it will take tremendous political change. And we tonight dedicate ourselves to that objective. So thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Brown. That was a very important wake up call of the difficulty that we are going to face over the next 15 years to try and achieve what we're, what we're trying to do here. Uh, those of you who are on cell phones and connected to the internet, you'd see something that's come up on screen. Uh, that's a link out there. This is, this is not a commitment only of leaders, of cities and of regions. It's a commitment of citizens across the world. So please click in there and you can also register your commitment to this process. This is being, uh, you know, it's been wide cast to people across the world. So we're expecting people to log in um, and, and do that from across the world. Uh, the next, I'm going to request uh, Mayor Park Stau, the mayor of Johannesburg, one of Africa's great cities. Uh, with a tremendously difficult legacy. Uh, it's been 20 years since apartheid planning was over, but he's dealing with that challenge both on the employment side and absolutely in the area of climate. So, Mayor Park, Stau. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to everybody. I, I, I think, of course, uh, to join everybody in welcoming Goal 11 as a particularly important step in the development of the sustainable development goals because it places city development, city strategies, and the issues that we're dealing with in our cities firmly on the agenda, not only from an agenda point of view, but also an ability for us to continuously evaluate the progress that we're making in the context of our cities. For us as African cities, it's particularly important as we continue to face high levels of migration and urbanization, and in many ways, as the city of Johannesburg, we are attracting an estimated 10,000 people every month who come into Johannesburg in search of opportunity. Many of these people are young people of the 4.8 million people that are in Johannesburg. We estimate that the majority are young people with an estimated number of a million young people who are not in employment, not in education. So the young people are facing the greatest brunt of poverty, unemployment, and inequality in our city. But in many ways, we think about it not only in the context of it, in terms of the challenges that we confront in our cities, but say to ourselves, how do we turn this into a dividend? How do we reap the rewards of the demographic dividend of having high levels of urbanization, but also a highly youthful population. And the ability to take advantage of that could set us on a different course to prosperity at the back of a city strategy that's informed, that's focused, and that's being implemented. And we developed in the city of Johannesburg a growth and development strategy that is a long-term plan and vision for our city to build a city that is resilient, a city that is sustainable, and a city that is livable. But in that context then said, what are the key outcomes 
of the city strategy that we need to achieve. But because of a lack of time, I won't go into the details of the strategy, but almost highlight some of the programs that we are implementing as a means of trying to take advantage of what we call the demographic dividend that we can reap from the, what in many instances people would consider challenges that African cities are facing. We have built a partnership with the private sector, uh, which partnership is focused on ensuring that within a period of 12 months, we're able to target 200,000 young people and match them to opportunity. And this matching to opportunity is about matching these young people at the most basic level for, for some of them to employment opportunities, for some of them directly into um, enterprise development opportunities, some of them directing them in the field of taking advantage of an initiative that we've taken from the US on massive open online learning and the establishment at the back of our own infrastructure of a MOOC program that we're driving in the city of Johannesburg so that we move beyond thinking of cities within the limitations of what we do as cities, but say, how can we direct young people into educational opportunities? We've, we've also built partnership with our local universities to enable and facilitate access to a different range of opportunities that are there in our city and the ability to match them to the partnerships that we're harnessing with the private sector. So in many ways for us, that's about creating an inclusive urbanism that takes advantage of the reality that there's this hunger for opportunity amongst young people and we could be able to create access for those young people into these opportunities. We've also developed a program that we aptly titled Josie at Work and it's about a community co-production model that is not only at the back of municipal infrastructure investment initiatives, but also together with our partners. I spoke about our partnerships with the universities. So as part of overcoming the digital divide that we experience, we've said that we would employ, and in fact, currently are training 3,000 young people whose task it would be over the next few months to overcome digital literacy programs in our city go into communities and teach those people who do not have access to um, the internet, who have not engaged with the digital revolution, of the opportunities that are there at the back of digital platforms and then be able to take advantage of the Wi-Fi hotspots that we're creating. So we're really saying how do we enable and facilitate this level of inclusion. But if you think about it in the, con in the context of a South African city, and in, in the context of any city, in fact, space and access to inclusion from a spatial point of view is very important. The South African city is designed for exclusion. It is designed essentially for separation, segregation, and marginalization of black people who would be living in the outskirts without adequate access to the urban amenity and opportunities. So, so through a program that we've titled The Corridors of Freedom, we're looking at strategic urban integration corridors that would enable people to have greater access to the opportunities in their cities. And we see these corridors as, in fact, we always say, that it is about stitching a city together which city was segregated and separated. How do we bring people closer to opportunity and opportunities closer to people and use space as the mechanism of doing that, but also drive it at the back of an integrated urban mobility strategy that enables ease of access into our city. And I thought that it might just be without going into the details of all the other programs that we're initiating and implementing an opportunity now to almost sit back and say we've reached the point where in the next 24 hours or so, there would be agreement on what is an important milestone for city governance. It is a period for us to reflect and say, how far have we come, but also an opportunity to say, how do we then harness these partnerships, not just with local South Africans, but with an international network of organizations for us to overcome the development challenges that we confront and to create inclusive urbanism in the South African context and in Johannesburg in particular. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mayor Tao. One of the interesting things that one notices is that in conversations in the United Nations, most of it is focused on challenges and problems. What, I, what I've learned, you know, traveling the world and talking to mayors across the world is the conversation with mayors immediately turns to focusing on, like we heard uh, the mayor of Johannesburg just now, on solving problems. And I think that is the real message of these partnerships. <laughs> Next, I'm going to invite the mayor of Bala Horizonte, Marcio Laceda, to speak. He's a twice-elected mayor of, of the city, and he has got a tremendous reputation as being one of the best mayors in Brazil. Mayor Laceda. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, opportunity to be here in this historical moment uh, where the mayors uh, have been uh, recognized as an important actors uh, in the uh, sustainability for our future. Uh, my compliments to the General Secretary Ben Ki-moon, Jeffrey Sachs, and uh, my, my congratulations also to the governor of California for this uh, leadership. So, um, <clears throat> Belo Horizonte uh, is a city of 2.5 uh, million people, the capital of the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. And um, in 2012, uh, ICLEI, organized a global congress in Belo Horizonte, uh, previous to the Rio uh, Plus 20 uh, meeting. And there, uh, more than uh, 400 cities um, from 70 countries uh, worked together during five days uh, to prepare the uh, the mayor's uh, <clears throat> participation in Rio Plus 20. And uh, we <clears throat> made a document to uh, address it to Ban Ki-moon, General Secretary. And the main, main uh, let's say, issue uh, was to <clears throat> ask for more protagonism uh, of the mayors and the cities in the discussion of the global issues. And uh, fortunately, we are now in the center of this discussion, and uh, we, uh, we, this moment, uh, our opportunity to uh, say uh, thank you to the Pope Francis and uh, Prized Marcelo Sorando, the, the invitation of the more than 60 uh, mayors of the world to be together in the Vatican in last July to discuss uh, the sustainability and uh, <clears throat> global warming. So, um, I'm also uh, president of the National Front of Mayors in Brazil, uh, there are associated to this organization around 150 uh, largest cities in Brazil. And uh, we organized each two years uh, the largest um, uh, meeting in Brazil regarding sustainability. The last meeting uh, in April uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> we had the participation of around 10,000 people, more than 500 Brazilian uh, mayors. And uh, we are very, very uh, committed to organize our city plans um, uh, involving the SDGs. In Belo, we worked uh, for the MDGs and with a good results. And our city was uh, chosen by 
uh, the UN as a pilot city uh, involving one observatory. And uh, I'm very, very confident that the new uh, SDGs will, will, be a, uh, will be a very, very uh, basis to organize our strategic plans in our city. We, we are just now revising our strategic plan for 2030, uh, made in 2009, uh, just to uh, uh, include the, the SDGs. So, um, I'm very happy and honored to be here in this moment. This represents a new area for the uh, cities, and certainly, we work together very hard to uh, to give to give to our our population uh, more life quality. Thank you. Thank you, Mela Seda. Again, to underlie the focus of the conversation. Cities find it much easier, even though operationally it's more difficult, to focus on the long run. It's not the play for this election and short-term electoral gains. When we're talking about long-term city plans, we're talking about commitments that are going to play themselves out for 15 to 30 years time. And we hear that all the time in this conversation, and maybe less in other places. So why is this sudden interest in cities? I mean, the obvious thing is the world is half urban. But more important, two-thirds or more of city economies, and certainly of the world economy, lies in cities. And I think more and more people are discovering that, both in national governments and also within the private sector. But like Governor Brown also highlighted, maybe three-fourths of the world's risks, including the climate risks and the opportunities, lie in cities. So it's a mix of those opportunities and challenges and the focus on solving them that makes cities and regions so important. Uh, the Mayor of Kingston, uh, Mayor Angela Burke. Good evening. Let me first add my own words of congratulations to the organizers of the event and providing the opportunity for us to actually have this discussion, which is certainly timely and extremely important. We have been talking about subnational governments. In the Jamaican context, we talk about local government. And I think part of what we have to remember as we have our discussion is that we are all at different places in our countries in terms of the independence and the authority of local government. So for example, it was only in 2015 that we were able to entrench local government in our constitution. And what that meant was that we now had a certain level of a certainty and independence because prior to that, with a simple stroke of a pen, because a decision was taken at the local level that central government didn't like, local government could have been dissolved. A municipality could have been dissolved. When you have that level of uncertainty, it is often difficult to make bold decisions. And so it's good to talk about bold decisions, but we also have to look at the context in which these decisions have to be made. So we have carried a good fight, and it's now entrenched in the, in the Constitution. It is with a series of laws that have all not yet been passed that would, for example, have a basic requirement of an actual strategic plan for the municipality. Persons might say, but well, how could a municipality function without a strategic plan? Well, we've been doing it for years. <laughs> but it is now a requirement. And it comes at a good time. It comes at a good time because as we discuss the SDGs, it also means that some of the areas that before probably would not have been a focus, we actually have an opportunity to do, to do that. Having said that, the national plan and vision that we speak about in Jamaica, which we just call Vision 2030, actually 
is very similar to the goals and the intent that are outlined in the Declaration of the City's Commitment to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. It reflects, I mean, we speak of the common good of all humanity, and it reflects our most basic human urges for harmonious cooperation, peaceful settlements, and whereas Vision 2030 speaks of Jamaica as a place of choice to live, work, raise family, and to do business. So as we have uh, this discussion, Jamaica is also at a significant turning point in terms of our economic reform and the condi conditionalities of the IMF agreement, which is a constraint for many of what we would want to do. Also in terms of our development priorities and the foundation of sustainable growth, which would be our priorities. And although the actions of the government have resulted in reduced unemployment, the figures are still far too high, and in particular among our youths. Our challenges have been exacerbated, certainly during the last year, by what some have termed as one of the worst droughts in recent times, leaving areas within the agricultural sector almost decimated. We have had basically no choice, therefore, than to focus on finding solutions. We have been concentrating on how to ensure that our farmers survive this drought, how to live having water every three days. We have been focused on looking at where we have invested so many resources with our catchment tanks, but where rain no longer falls. And so rain is falling on the other side, where there are no catchment tanks, making distribution of water an extremely difficult, difficult task. But our four national goals are mapped into 50 national outcomes. And as I said before, these fit into the sustainable national development plan that we have. And it also forms the basis of the work that we're doing in Kingston. In 2012, when uh, the current administration, which I lead, when we took office, we thought that with limited resources, one of the best things to do was to make sure that we invited participation and that we promoted a participatory approach to governance. When you have scarce resources, you have to make use of what is the greatest resource that you have, which is our people and the ideas and the experience and the expertise that they have. In fact, in one of our first town hall meetings that we had, the news media made such a big deal about the discussion between the citizens and the municipality, thinking that the world was coming to an end because persons with passion were arguing for what they wanted and placing on the table the issues that were of importance to them. It has taken us quite some time for persons to understand that these are not quarrels. These are passionate conversations and that it is indeed passion that drives our priorities. And that's how we come to understand what consensus is. <laughs> we have carried this approach throughout all we do, and so on a monthly basis we meet with the private sector, with other agencies within the city to make sure that we're all on the same page and to make sure as well that when there are issues, we can quickly deal with the misunderstandings and make sure we can work as a joined up government. The city, in the city, we have established a youth task force that too is part of that participatory thrust. And the idea is to identify a group of young people whose task it is to look at the city and what's happening at their own lives and to say, what can the city do better in response to the needs of our young people? How can we get their views integrated into, in what we're doing? There, there's so much more that I could talk about. I probably want to just talk about one other, which is the service that we've been doing to the homeless. 
we have um, a, a significant homeless population. Some of them are deportees, whether they are from the United States, from Canada, from the UK. They come home as individuals with really no roots in Jamaica, although they are of Jamaican heritage, and they have nowhere to go and nothing to do. And they become a burden on the state. And so part of what we do, and we, we have been able to garner funding from a number of sources, including um, from, from um, the EU, to set up a halfway house where we're able to help them to integrate into society. We also, for years, have had uh, individuals with, who are mentally challenged. Uh, and back in the days, the, people never talk about individuals who had mental challenges. They were kind of hidden and in the background. And what we have been able to do quite successfully is a number of individuals are now being treated at home instead of in our institutions. And those that still remain on the streets, we're able from time to time to remove them from the streets, to take them back to the shelter, make sure that they're taking their medication, that they have a bath, and that they're able to be fed. When we spoke a couple months ago about how difficult it was for individuals to just feed people on the street, we were taken to task. The church said, this is what we do. How dare you try to regulate the service that we offer to the poor? We have brought them in, we have had the conversation, and we explained to them, when you have sites where individuals are able to come and be fed, they can be tested, they can bathe, they can eat, they'll be able to take their medication. When you just feed them around the street, what happens when you go is that they come right back there and it becomes a problem. And so what we found is that working, building that partnership, it has been working. And the results is far, are far more than we probably would have thought in the beginning. So I guess my, the one point I want, want to leave is just how important it is to build that participatory approach to governance. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Burke. I think the importance here is not only what you said, passionate participation, but also the sense of compassion that we often lose when we're looking at challenges and people as objects or citizens that are very far. But I'm, I'm really happy that you outlined a very important challenge that I think cities and regions across much of the world face, and that is the disempowerment with respect to national government. Not only political dis disempowerment, but also fiscal disempowerment. And that discussion has to start in many parts of the world. And it is that discussion that will en enable us to move forward in an actual partnership. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the, uh, the technical mayor uh, um, of, of Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, Mayor Kabel. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. In this room, at this very moment, is the capacity to make the world a better place. We can't do it all at once, but we do have the opportunity to change the world one little step at a time. And through the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we also now have a common direction. Officially, I could simply state that Copenhagen fully commits to the goals, each and every single part of it. But I would like to add that I personally believe in a sustainable and better future. I do believe that we can achieve these goals, though they may sound like a daunting challenge. Ending world hunger, lifting everyone from the clutches of poverty, and making every human settlement on the globe safe and sustainable are certainly ambitious goals, but they are possible. They have to be possible. Copenhagen wants to, to contribute to that ambition. We need to fight poverty and, and hunger globally. And though Copenhageners aren't poor by international standards, we still need to achieve a higher de degree of equality among our citizens, simply because it's the right thing to do. We are dedicated to greater equality and sustainable, sustainability, both locally and globally. The 2030 Agenda can achieve this dream if we commit to making the future of today the norm of tomorrow, by making the pioneering thoughts our common mindset. This will be our new drivers for sustainability, taking over 
from Local Agenda 21. We are taking the first step today by committing each other, by looking each other straight in the eyes and promising that we will make the world a better place. As simple as that. I believe that cities play a central part in these plans because we have an access that no one else has, a direct access to our citizens. We do need governments and international bodies like the UN, and in our case, the European Union, to create a framework where we can act. But in the end, it's up to us to create the change needed. And I say this because we so often, and so, so, sorry, we so rarely remind ourselves that when we get bogged down in the oftentimes slow-moving reality of it all, we need to remember that we are making the world a better place. There is the one goal in particular directed straight to, or, to us, making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. To me, it's obvious that a city I would lo love to live in, that's a city that is, of course, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. That's not an abstract goal. That goal is simply the description of a good city. The way we go about achieving our goals in Copenhagen is to focus on the solutions that give us more than one output by engaging our citizens in the right choice and by making the right choice the best option, the easy option, and by making sustainability living a bit more tangible. In Copenhagen, we are dedicated to becoming the world's first carbon neutral capital by 2025. That is an ambitious goal but I, leap, I do believe we will get there. But when we try to reduce carbon emissions in transportation by promoting bicycles, for instance, we aren't just reducing carbon emissions. We are also making the traffic safer so kids can take the bike to school by themselves without parents worrying a bit. So we try to make the green choice the easy choice so that people don't have to think green in order to be green, they simply have to choose the easy way out. Obviously, I know that, though I am a bike-loving mayor, the bicycle can't change the world in itself. But they are one of the small steps that we can take to minimize our impact on the planet and remind ourselves how many benefits there are to a sustainable lifestyle. It is one of the many small steps towards a better world. When we clean up our harbor, we're not just making our city more in tune with nature. We're not just creating a sustainable area for fish and marine life. We are also providing Copenhageners with a place to swim. And by doing so, we remind them of the importance of clean water. We remind them of the importance of living in a sustainable environment. There is no doubt that in Copenhagen we need to change the way we consume. We consume way too much in what is possible in a future world. We need to be reminded of what sustainability really is. We are trying to do that, one small step at a time. But I do believe that if we promise each other to help each other to achieve these small steps, it is possible. We can change the world. Thank you. We can change the world one step at a time, one city, one region at a time. And if that actually happens, what it will add up to is tremendous. 600 to 800 million new jobs over the next 15 years. Five billion people who will get universal health care and education. It's never been done in history before. And depending on what we do about informal settlements, providing adequate housing, water, and sanitation, to somewhere between one and two billion people. So it is the small steps and that sense that we can actually do it and we commit that will make the difference in the long run. I'm going to invite the mayor of uh, Bandarache, uh, Mayor Jamal, to speak to us. This is a city that has been uh, tremendously ravaged uh, in time that we've all looked to, uh, like New Orleans will speak a little bit later, uh, the impact of the Indian Ocean tsunami. So the mayor of Bandarache, Mayor Jamal. Forgive my statement over there. Yes, please. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, and distinguished speakers. I am delighted to be able to attend and to address this high-level forum. I wish to reflect on how important to have a set of viable and definite goals for development. The set of viable and definite goal for development, the definite goal help us to understand the issue. The respond the issues, allocate better use of resource, and to record our responses for best practices and listen learn. We are aware that urbanization is a global trend and shortly we will find ourselves dealing with urban issues more frequently. Economically, cities will become more important part of the economy entities. Pressure to provide human and safe human settlement will soon become one of biggest challenge in sustaining the develop and sociality uh, we will need to acknowledge the faster social value change in the due course. The biggest question to us is, are we ready for those? Cities are hopes, and at the same time, the hopes are fragile. Cities have scarce resource and severely exposed to repeat climate change, disaster risk, and increasing human needs for service. Cities must overlay the roadmap of sustainable development today. Challenge must be addressed. Urban public police must be strong and future friendly. Local entities must be powerful enough to play their role in the urban setting. Values must be cultivated and discipline must become the main source of energy for sustainable development. During the UN's conference on disaster risk reduction that took place this year in Sendai, local authorities and national government recalled the need to strengthen their teeth to better cooperate on this matter, mainly because local authorities are the first level of response when a disaster happens, whatever the place and the country it occurs. We from UCLG and UCLG ASPAC call for all true localization of the new development agenda, localizing action in planning and in preventing the risk, localizing action in the post-disaster recovery should be essential part of the new agenda. The government of Banda Aceh commit to involve actively in the overall process and I pledge my commitment to transform Banda Aceh City as one of role model for resilient city in the planet. This commitment is an important part to regrouping our limited resource, institutionalizing our value and strengthen and moving forward. Our unique Islamic value will serve at the basic of sustainable development, the value inspire our pro citizen to gradually transform into more disciplined, more sensitive, and tolerant citizen who work hard to master their strength and who understand that they are the essence of, of sustainable development. The values will encourage more participation to engage in positive externalities in definite in TVTs. And the value which will put future responsibilities as one of personal responsibility. One of the basic articles of our faith as a Muslim, the majority in the city of Banda Aceh, is that we shall be the blessing or rahmah for the whole earth where we all belong. So we believe that we should have one heart for one and only earth. I will also wish to encourage the forum to set up a city resourceful repository, bringing up all accessible knowledge available today for city government learning process. Networking is always the key of success in carrying such noble ambition. The repository will also 
enable universities, research center, NGO, and other who have been working hard to study how to tackle urban issue and problem, to engage actively in the due process. In particular, I invite those universities, research center, NGOs, and donor initiative to come and burden the research and activities in my city. I commit to learn from the research and to possible extend <clears throat> utilize the technologies to improve the quality of service and to keep my citizens safe. And I do believe that by acknowledging the degree and safety of the issue, overlaying the root map, red purping resource, utilizing uh, the knowledge and technology, and building from institutionalized core Islamic values 10 years from today, you will hear the voice from my citizen saying, yes, we are now ready. Allow me to conclude by congratulating all of us for coming together. We look forward to putting our shared goal in place and sharing the objective of the post-2015 summit embedded in Sendai framework, the new urban agenda and the Habitant Tree Conference next year. Thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to having stronger collaboration with you all. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. I think the emphasis here of a city that is recovered from a dramatic event like Bandarache has, and then is reaching out to the rest of the world to exchange with universities and with all of us who are doing things in other places is really important. To move now from Asia to another geography that was also devastated uh, 10 years after Katrina, uh, Mitch Landro from New Orleans. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. It's so nice to be with you, Jeffrey, and uh, to med Bill de Blasio and his entire team for uh, arranging what I think is going to be a very hectic week uh, for everybody that's here today, Governor Brown, and to my fellow mayors from across the world. Uh, as was said, last month we commemorated the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it was one of the worst disasters in American history. It was, in fact, a man-made disaster. Uh, 1,800 of our brothers and sisters were dead. Over a, a million Americans were displaced. A million housing units were damaged. After the federal levees broke, 80% of the city of New Orleans was underwater. Uh, the stories that all of us saw uh, are really seared in our souls. You saw the rushing flood pulling people under. Uh, we had survivors that were trapped for days with little or no help. Hundreds of people were on rooftops in the blazing sun that you could almost feel through your television screen. Uh, thousands of American citizens were crowded on the steps of the Superdome uh, on the pavement in front of the convention center. Uh, floating, bloated, dead bodies were on the streets of America, an amazing sight that I don't think people ever thought that they would see. And in that moment, it all converged for us. A veil had been lifted, and it revealed a very ugly and very scary reality that people had not contemplated before. It revealed a very simple fact that we are all vulnerable, that our problems from neglect uh, to poverty, to inequality, environmental degradation, uh, disrepair of our infrastructure could actually destroy us if we did not really change. So there's no other city in the world that really understands the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals more than the city of New Orleans because uh, we have lived it and we have uh, physically and in a very, very personal way felt the pain because those that died were our brothers and sisters and our mothers and fathers, our aunts and uncles, and in some instances, terrible stories of fathers uh, losing touch with their children who slipped into the water uh, never to be seen again. Uh, indeed, for us, Katrina, uh, and after that, uh, 
showed us very simply that necessity really was the mother of invention. And to, in order for us to survive, we literally had to find another way. Uh, now New Orleans has gone from literally being underwater to one of the fastest growing cities in America with thousands of new jobs, new industries, rapidly improving schools, a rising property values, new stronger flood protection that are going to reduce the risk from hurricanes that we know are coming more frequently, are going to be bigger, they're going to be stronger, uh, and in some instances, uh, unavoidable. Uh, our work is particularly aligned with goal eight of the SDGs, which reads, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Uh, so Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sarando, who's with us in the audience, uh, Bishop, it's so nice to see you. I'm going to talk about the Pope in a minute, but uh, all of the SDGs are surrounding what the Pope spoke about today, and that is its focus on people. And so New Orleans, as wonderful as we are in so many ways, continues to have the same very serious challenges that every city in America has. Uh, too much of America and the world is a place of great inequality. Uh, thousands don't have the skills and the education to get a good job that provides for the sustainability of our family. Uh, and if you don't have a good job and you can't sustain a family, it's hard to sustain a community or a civil society. Let me just give you an example. In the city of New Orleans, 52% of African-American men are not working. That lack of hopeful opportunity is the root of many, many problems. And we can't leave anybody behind. So in New Orleans, we have uh, sought to do things that make a difference. We have raised the minimum wage for city employees to $10.10 uh, .10 per hour as part of our economic opportunity strategy that we've designed. We've designed uh, intensive programs that can create pathways to prosperity where people can be recruited, trained, and connected to good jobs that exist or that are being created. A reentry for many of our ex-offenders that uh, are involved in a system of mass incarceration is another priority that I have in what I call the NOLA for Life program. We want to make sure that those leaving prison can find a better pathway and have a second chance. Uh, as it is said, the race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong, uh, but to those that endure to the end. And we should think about that often. Uh, no matter the past, anyone who works hard and takes responsibility should be able to get a good job that supports a family, and that creates generational wealth. Then we will stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. From there, goal 11 of the SDGs is also very important. It reads, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Because for the first time in history, more people live in cities that don't. And this is both a huge multi-layered challenge and a big time opportunity for all of us. In New Orleans, we're taking a lesson on sustainability from the Dutch and the Netherlands, learning to live with water, using things like permeable pavement and water plazas. We're also rebuilding Smarter as one of the largest residential solar cities in the United States with high sustainability standards for public buildings like schools and like libraries. At the same time, we're also investing millions in new streetcar lines and transportation, bicycle lanes, in the city's core, and we're seeing progress on the big urban issues from housing blight, violence, homelessness, and health care access by building uh, primary care centers and, of course, new regional centers of excellence to sustain people's health. There's also goal four, which is ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So the most important development that we have seen in New Orleans since Hurricane Katrina is a complete refocus on how we educate our children. The pathway to prosperity absolutely goes through the schoolhouse doors. And now we have a new unique system of almost exclusive autonomous public charter schools. Our kids are learning. Before Katrina, 62% of our students went to failing schools. Now that is down to 6%. Before Katrina, only about half of our kids graduated. Now the graduation rate is up to 73%. Fewer kids are dropping out, more kids are graduating, more are enrolling in college, and the amount of uh, money that they're getting to go to colleges has increased exponentially. This is a big deal. 
Uh, New Orleans schools are improving faster than anywhere else in the world. We have spent a combined $1.8 billion on new buildings to build dozens state-of-the-art 21st century knowledge-based schools. We have opened 20 of them now. Another 15 will open in the next uh, two years. Uh, for those of you that have not had the chance to listen to His Holiness' speech to Congress, uh, I would ask you to do that. Uh, shortly after leaving the halls of Congress, arguably one of the most powerful physical spaces in the world, the Pope then went to St. Joseph's to meet with the homeless. He did that for a reason. And during his speech at Congress, uh, whether he was talking about violence, poverty, climate change, immigration, death penalty, or the family, he gave us a key to what it is that he was speaking about when he spoke about the refugees. And he said, and I paraphrase, do not be daunted by the number. You should not see them as a number. You need to look into their face and see them as a brother and a sister. Uh, he spoke to us, of course, uh, from the perspective of uh, we should treat others as we would want to be treated. Uh, what you do to the least of us, that you do unto me. And began to speak of us about reorienting everything that we do not by virtue of looking at the institutions and whether or not people serve institutions, but remember that institutions were designed uh, to serve the individual, the people, the families, and in that way, orienting ourselves to create sustainability wrapped around the dignity of the human being and the familial institutions that make us strong. And so I uh, commend what it is that he talked to us about today, and of course he'll speak tomorrow at the United Nations to the world as well, about reorienting everything that we're doing. And of course, Jeffrey, that is exactly what the Sustainable Development Goals are designed to do. And so I, I would say to all of us that we should actually have faith uh, and hope. If anybody in the United States of America in the year 2000, Governor Brown said, that we were gonna have an African-American president or bishop, a pope that was a Jesuit from South America, the world would have laughed. They would have said that that, in fact, would never be possible. And of course, both of those things occurred, and both of those men were together yesterday at the White House. And I guess someone says, Maj, well, if those things are possible, well, then anything is. And so I say to the mayors today, it's up to the mayors the world over to find the resources uh, to build the coalitions to fix the problems. We can't leave anybody behind. And the fact of the matter is that we have to do it all. And we can't do it one at a time. And as Dr. Sachs said, we have to do it now. So the challenge has been laid before us, and I'm thankful for it. It's a sweet burden, but we've been here before. We've faced challenges as large and as difficult, and we've overcome. Uh, and the reality is that we can't afford to fail. Uh, again and again, our resolve has been tested, and together, again, uh, we will either find a way or we will make one. Thank you very much. We will find a way or we will make one. I think that's one of the more powerful statements that I've heard. Um, today and, and for a long time. This is really the spirit, I think, of mayors ac across the world. Unfortunately, it took the experience of Katrina, uh, and I, I would imagine that for many of us across the world, we should be able to reach out exactly for what Mitch Landrew has said without having to go through the experience of Katrina and be able to link goal after goal, like he said, education, health, food, water, energy, we have to do them all, and we have to do them at once. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is the challenge before us. Um, I, I'm going to invite um, the mayor of Dakar, uh, Khalifa Sal, to speak, please. Merci beaucoup. Vous, on a parlé anglais tout le temps, et la durabilité, c'est aussi la diversité. Nous avons fait l'effort de comprendre l'anglais. Je vous invite à faire l'effort de me comprendre en français. <rire> euh, mesdames et messieurs, il m'a été demandé au nom de 
UCLG de parler des collectivités locales africaines face aux nouveaux objectifs. Tout le monde convient aujourd'hui, et on le dit souvent, que l'Afrique est la locomotive de demain. C'est ça qu'on dit. J'espère que ce n'est pas un slogan et qu'on y croit. Et que nous avons tous dit que le développement pour être efficace devra se faire à la base. Le slogan que nous partageons tous, penser global et agir local. Ce que nous vivons aujourd'hui est une consécration. Je crois que des hommes comme Jean Claus, comme le professeur Sachs et d'autres hommes de terrain qui sont en face de moi, d'autres acteurs, ont contribué à ce qu'aujourd'hui qu'on ait l'objectif 11. Cet objectif 11 est une vraie réussite. Il faut s'en féliciter. C'est vrai, ce n'était pas évident. Donc, il faut féliciter et remercier tous ceux qui se sont investis pour qu'on en arrive là. Mais le, une chose est d'y arriver, une autre chose est maintenant de mériter cette confiance, mais surtout de jouer le rôle qui doit être le nôtre à ce niveau. C'est la raison pour laquelle UCLJ invite tous les acteurs à continuer ensemble à se battre pour véritablement relever ce défi. Et c'est dans ce cadre-là que les cultes locales africaines ont décidé de prendre leur part dans l'action de développement de l'Afrique ce continent qu'on dit meurtri, mais qui est un continent d'espérance et d'espoir. Puisqu'aujourd'hui, l'Afrique se présente comme un monde uni qui a conscience de ses potentialités, de ses opportunités et qui a décidé de les assumer. En tout cas, c'est comme ça, c'est comme cela que nous concevons notre rôle en tant que collectivité locale. Nous allons donc accompagner nos gouvernements nationaux pour mériter cette confiance, pour relever les défis auxquels les populations africaines sont confrontées. Puisque la gouvernance locale, c'est là où se rassemblent toutes les confrontations et toutes les réalités. Mais c'est là où se retrouvent toutes les possibles. C'est pourquoi nous allons essayer de relever ce défi sur le plan social d'abord. Le premier défi, il est social. Comment faire en sorte que nous puissions régler nos problèmes de manière efficace et efficiente Il faudra que les cultes locales africaines puissent aider les États nationaux à cultiver, à asseoir la paix. Sans paix, on ne peut rien faire. C'est la première condition aujourd'hui. Quand nous regardons les télévisions du monde, nous sommes meurtris par le fait que toutes les télévisions ne montrent que les scènes de guerre les scènes de pandémie, les scènes de désastre en Afrique. Il faut que cela cesse. Et pour ce faire, il faudrait que les cultes locales et la gouvernance locale africaine s'affirment. Nous avons pendant 50 ans vécu dans une politique de dépendance vis-à-vis -vis de l'extérieur. C'était l'aide qui a montré ses limites. C'est la réduction de la pauvreté. Aujourd'hui, nous ne voulons plus de réduction de la pauvreté. Nous voulons de l'éradication de, de la pauvreté. Nous en avons assez de ces jeunes Africains qui sont dans les boat people, qui sont dans les bateaux et qu'on recueille ou qu'on rejette. Nous devons donc conduire une politique sociale africaine qui prennent en compte l'éducation, la santé, le chômage et l'emploi. C'est ça la réponse que nous devons donner à ces populations éprouvées et pourtant qui continuent d'espérer. Le deuxième défi auquel nous sommes confrontés pour réussir toujours ces objectifs de durabilité, ce sont les, les défis économiques. Nous sommes un continent riche. Nous sommes un continent où l'investissement est le plus rentable. Mais malheureusement, nous sommes le continent de toutes les urgences. Nous avons des déficits en infrastructure, 
des déficits multiformes. Nous devons compter sur nous-mêmes pour les combler. C'est bon d'être avec les autres, mais il faut arrêter la politique de la main tendue et collaborer avec les autres, construire des partenariats d'égale dignité. Que l'Afrique compte sur elle-même, sur ses ressources, sur ses enfants, avant de s'ouvrir aux autres. Je crois que le développement économique de l'Afrique dépend d'abord de l'Afrique elle-même. Mais ça ne doit pas être des discours. Et c'est pourquoi nous nous réjouissons des premiers pas qui sont actuellement faits à Addis Abeba, avec cet objectif 2060, ce programme 2060, qui va construire, qui va consister à construire le développement de l'Afrique de manière durable avec tout le monde. Le troisième défi, c'est le défi de l'environnement. De ce point de vue, l'Afrique s'interroge. Les autres se sont déjà développés. Ils ont pris leur part de pollution. On nous demande de nous développer sans polluer ou de moins polluer. Je ne veux pas faire de polémique, mais je veux partager cette question qui est essentielle. Quand un pays prend une centrale à charbon, on dit c'est polluant. Quand un pays utilise un diesel, on dit c'est polluant. Quand un pays africain, comment devrons-nous nous développer en utilisant de l'énergie propre, mais moins chère, c'est-à-dire accessible C'est en cela que nous interpellons la communauté internationale. Nous sommes prêts à y aller, mais il faudra y mettre les moyens. Le, le troisième défi, c'est celui de la gouvernance, puisque je veux respecter mes cinq minutes. C'est celui de la gouvernance. L'Afrique est aujourd'hui perçue, et nous faisons notre mea culpa, comme une terre de corruption. Comme une terre, parce qu'il n'y a qu'un Africain qui peut dire ce que je dis. Vous l'auriez dit, on aurait parlé de racisme ou d'autres choses. Par contre, nous, nous devons accepter nos manquements et nos défauts. Il faut que nous puissions instaurer en Afrique une gouvernance vertueuse, une gouvernance inclusive, une gouvernance propre, une gouvernance qui favorise le développement et qui ne permet plus à nos dirigeants de s'enrichir. C'est aussi, une... aussi une exigence de développement. Ce que les Africains ont mis comme argent dans des banques offshore et en Europe, si on les rapatriait, l'Afrique se développerait sans avoir besoin de personne. C'est ça la vérité. Comment instaurer une gouvernance sobre, vertueuse, propre, où l'on sanctionne et punit ce qui détourne et vole Si l'Afrique le réglait, elle créerait aussi les bases d'un développement durable. Je pense enfin que l'économie sociale et solidaire est une voie il faudra que nous puissions l'explorer et en utiliser tous les ressorts pour construire l'Afrique de demain. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for making the connection, especially between governance and the political economy of development. So for our final speaker of today, uh, the mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, I believe he is not far from us. <laughs> I just flew in from St. Patrick's Cathedral, and boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> the Americans in the room will understand that joke. Uh, thank you very much, Aramar. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. So many wonderful leaders and thinkers and activists from around the world. I actually did just come here just moments ago from St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, and had the opportunity uh, to hear the first remarks uh, by His Holiness Pope Francis here in New York City. And uh, I will speak about uh, his extraordinary relevance to everything we're talking about here today. But I will also tell you my favorite line I've come up with this week. I said the greatest uh, voice Uh, for justice and morality anywhere in the world. Pope Francis coming to the greatest city in the world, New York City, is a match made in heaven. 
trying out new material here. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being a part of this extraordinarily important gathering. Uh, I have to say a thank you, a deep thank you, to Jeff Sachs uh, for all the leadership he provides. Uh, if Jeffrey Sachs didn't exist, we would have to invent him because he has a tireless ability to both think of what can be done that was previously believed to be unreachable and to convince the rest of us to do it and to go to all corners of the earth and spread that message uh, in a thoroughly documented and believable way. So, uh, Jeff, thank you, because we need leaders like you and we have one. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to thank all the wonderful leaders from around the globe here on the stage. I have to say, as an American, I am very proud that my nation is represented here uh, by two extraordinary leaders, Governor Jerry Brown of California and Mayor Mitch Landrieu of New Orleans, who both spoke with such passion. We thank them for their tremendous leadership. And Mitch, when you tell the story of New Orleans, it grips us all because what your city went through, sadly, was the eye-opener and the wake-up call for so many of us, uh, both in terms of climate change and uh, the injustices we face in our economy as well. And the two came together so tragically in your city. Thank you for persevering. And Governor Brown, thank you uh, for taking a context. And I said this when we were at a gathering together in uh, Rome, that His Holiness uh, put together calling leaders from around the world to speak about these very issues. And I said that Governor Brown, with the largest state in the United States of America, has set the pace and uh, shown us all that we can and must reach higher in terms of goals for fighting climate change. And if California weren't doing it, I'd say this, I say this as a New Yorker, and it, Governor Brown knows it's hard to find a lot of humility among New Yorkers, but I will exhibit some here and say if California weren't doing it, we wouldn't be anywhere near as far along as we are as a country, and so many of us in other parts of the country wouldn't be making the progress we are. So giving credit where credit is due, thank you, Governor Brown. But all that credit, uh, all worthy, I have to say, uh, the most special credit today goes to His Holiness, because uh, Pope Francis has now defined our mission, our common mission in terms I don't think we've ever seen before. Uh, the way he has combined the global fight against inequality with the global fight against the problems of climate change uh, has been so clear, so morally sound, so urgent that it is changing hearts and minds constantly and rapidly. I think his address to the U.S. Congress today is going to be an example of something that will be looked back on as a moment of change unto itself. And it is powerful for all of us. I'm sure uh, some of you here today feel as I have from time to time over the years. Sometimes it feels like we're laboring in the vineyards alone or we're voices in the wilderness. But Pope Francis has changed that equation profoundly. Arguably the most important moral voice, in my view, absolutely the most important moral voice in the world, pulling people urgently towards these twin missions and looking at how they, in fact, go together seamlessly. And that is an amazing moment in history to be doing, doing our work during. That is a wind in our sails that we could only have dreamed of just a few years ago. The papal encyclical, Laudato Si, uh, talks about climate change, and I would say in some of the strongest, clearest, bluntest terms of any document anywhere, and puts it in a moral framework. And I think if anyone hesitated previously to recognize the depth of the challenge, uh, that encyclical uh, puts to rest doubt, puts to rest any impulse to incrementalism or partial solutions. It demands urgent and larger solutions now. 
And that gives us all a platform in which to succeed in our work. Look, today is a great example. On the eve of the UN General Assembly and on the eve of such powerful new steps on sustainability goals and on climate change, today, this very day, two crucial steps, the signing of the under two MOU and the gathering of this Urban Partnership for Sustainable Development Goals. Both of these are indicators of progress, are steps that wouldn't have been easily achieved, again, just a few years ago. Now, I'm a believer when you, when you have that kind of opening, when you see that progress starting to build unto itself, when real momentum is occurring, uh, the, only, the only response to that is to go faster and be more resolute and bring more people into the fold. And I'm thrilled that so many cities are answering the call. And I believe that so many of us at the local level, and certainly at the state level here in this country, will be the decisive elements in moving our national governments. We all know our national governments must go farther and faster. We all know the Paris Conference looms as a deadline, and a deadline of profound urgency for the fate of the globe. We at the grassroots need more than ever to set the pace. Our actions speak louder than words. Our actions change minds by showing what's possible. So I'll simply say to you today, we in New York City are trying with every tool we have to show in a large, complicated, diverse urban environment that many things are possible that were deemed unreachable before. We are living as best we can in the spirit of Pope Francis, redefining what our obligation to each other is, redefining our common humanity and talking about and acting on it. I have a plan for this city we announced some months ago called One NYC, and the very concept was a single future for all people, no matter what backgrounds, no matter what their economic status, a single future. And this plan very clearly integrated the notion that economic sustainability and environmental sustainability had to go hand in hand. It was inconceivable to separate those notions anymore. An environmentalist who doesn't care about economic justice or someone who fights for the rights of working people and the poor but doesn't think the environment matters, those two ends of the spectrum are missing the fact that these two pieces are now inextricable. We can't create economic opportunity and fairness if we don't address climate change. We can't address climate change if we don't create a world where there's actually true opportunity for all and true leadership from the grassroots. All of these pieces come together. In our plan, they are fully integrated. And it fits so much of the vision that you see in the Sustainable Development Goals. We said, as an easy juxtaposition, we said we would not have a city that was uh, economically strong and environmentally weak or environmentally strong and economically weak. We said we must achieve a strength on both pieces of the equation. So for example, in this city, where sadly 46% of the people in this city of eight and a half million people live at or near the poverty level. That is what the Great Recession yielded in this city. We said that we wanted to lift fully a tenth of our population out of poverty, 800,000 people out of poverty over the next 10 years. That was necessary to have a truly sustainable city. And equally, we said that we had to reach the standard of an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050 or we weren't a sustainable city. And we also believe that if we could take those two goals and bring them to life, we could help put the wind in the sails and momentum into the efforts of all our colleagues, just as they do for us, that we would set a new standard. And our national government and other national governments eventually would have no choice but to try to keep up, because the people would more and more demand it. I, I fundamentally believe this. Every time we make progress, the people lead us. They take that progress, and then they demand more. And they lead the larger society in the right direction. When we talk in this city 
about retrofitting all our public buildings in the next 10 years, there's tremendous popular support. When we talk in the city about what we've done, doubling the number of solar institutions, excuse me, installations, solar installations in our city, we know the people want it. They understand that we have to be sustainable. They understand what's happening to the earth. Sadly, extreme weather has taught people all they need to know about climate change, and it's given them the urgency that sometimes national leaders don't have. So I'll conclude with this. I think it's a tremendously optimistic moment, despite all we're up against. I think there's so much to latch on to now to build our progress. The good work of all my colleagues gives us hope. The fact that we are gathered together in common cause gives us hope. The fact that we're on the verge of great progress at the United Nations gives us hope. The fact that the greatest moral voice in the world, Pope Francis, is calling us to action gives us hope. It is a profoundly hopeful moment. In that moment, our job is to dig deeper, work harder, go farther, listen to the voices of the people more intently, take that urgency and put it into action. We're only a few months from Paris. I know we will look back and say in these months, so much that would determine the fate of the Earth was acted upon. If we do our job right, those actions will add up. The sum total will be sufficient. The progress will be enough to take us where we need to go. That is our mandate. I conclude with a simple, simple <coughs> statement from one of the greatest leaders we've known in many, many decades, Nelson Mandela, a man who epitomized the ability to see what had not yet been conceptualized by the conventional wisdom and eventually bring it to bear. And he said something simple. He said, it always seems impossible until it is done. I look forward to greeting you all in December when it is done. Thank you. The challenge of making it possible the move to implementation. I think today we've actually crossed the boundary. The MDGs were about poor people in poor countries. The SDGs saw, show us very clearly, as the mayor of New York has, talked, has, has showed us just now, that it affects everybody everywhere. The SDGs are about the integration and the implication for all people everywhere. There are two big steps for us, one in Paris in November, and the second, uh, next year in Habitat 3, as we embrace the new urban agenda, I'd like to invite to the stage uh, the Minister of Housing and Urban Development of the Government of Ecuador, uh, Minister Maria Duarte, to talk to us and invite us to take the next big leap forward as we step into Habitat 3. Mayor Duarte. Hello, good evening. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs, Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, thank you for this invitation. Dr. John Kloss, Executive Director of the UN Habitat. Mr. David E. Van Sant, President of the New School. Distinguished representatives of local governments here present, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank all the institutions for the organization of the high level, this high level event, which highlights the importance of a strong partnership between national and local governance, academia, private sector, and civil society. We have heard very insightful statements which reflect the commitment towards the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goal 11, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. In this line, the government of Ecuador seeks to achieve urban development through efficient public policies that promote social inclusion in order to eradicate poverty, promote equitable redistribution of resources and wealth, and foster adequate decentralization processes and balanced territorial management. We think we have the clue for all of that. It's our uh, regime, political regime. Our constitution is based on the ancestral vision of Andean peoples called 
Suma causai in our native language, what means living well, buen vivir. Paradigm chance, paradigm chance in how we conceive human beings and their integration with the collective and the nature. Different development model based on achievement harmony with nature. Clear restriction while deficiencies in meeting people's basic needs remain. The needs of humans over everything will prevail. Dear friends, Habitat 3 will be the next milestone in the road to achieve sustainable development, given that it would be the first UN World Conference to be held after the adoption of the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development and hopefully a meaningful and ambitious agreement of climate change for the end of the year. It's my pleasure to forward the message from His Excellency President, my country, Rafael Correa Delgado, for all of you to visit us and participate in the current preparatory activities to the third United Nations Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development Habitat 3 in Quito, in Ecuador, from October 17th to October 20th, 2016, to build together a new UBA agenda. We wait you all over there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So this is a great thank you to everybody who's here, who brought us here. We know the next two steps, the Paris COP and Habitat 3 uh, in Ecuador. I'm going to close the proceedings here and invite all the major leaders, of mayors and local governments to come up. We're going to take a photograph of all of us together to mark this process. I believe, and I've been told that most people have read the mayoral declaration online. There's no need for us to actually read it out. Uh, and we will sort of sign it later um, downstairs. So if I can invite uh, the mayors and leaders of local governments uh, to step up here, uh, we will now take a photograph that actually will record this very important event at the new school. So those of us who are on stage, if you can stay here and if the mayors can come up, please. Okay, so you can just dump it. Yeah. yeah.